absolutely ridiculous. Right, we're back, everybody, and it has been a crazy, crazy week. We did a pretty nice video, I think, last week, and you can see it. We'll link yeah, it I somewhere up here. It. But you know what, Abby? The whole week, I've just had this one question, and that has been, mm -hmm. could this whole thing have been avoided? Were there warning signs that people didn't mm -hmm. see? And is there, you know, and who's to blame, right? Maybe this thing could have been avoided. What you do mean, you think? You mean people can stop Russia to do the war even like before they can try to prevent, right? Yeah, because I mean, it's a tragedy, right? I mean, there's, there are people dying. It's war. None of us want to see war. Mm -hmm. Th it doesn't matter which side it's on. There's mm -hmm. people dying. And war happens when the talking stops, I suppose. Yeah, and I don't think it, it will not be all of a sudden and Putin decided, oh, okay, I'm going to have a war. It's mm. um, a long term. He's going to maybe plan for it, think about it. Yeah. So why he have this so right? Sure. We're pushing into the corner and have sure. to, to implant the war yeah. to Europe. Right, so we're going to get into that. But before we do, if you appreciate our work, please hit that subscribe button or the like button or mm -hmm. hopefully share it with a friend and ask them to subscribe. Mm -hmm. It'll really help us. Yeah. And yeah, we enjoy trying to show you guys things that you, know, that you might not have time to research for yourselves. Yeah, that's the one, right? Okay, good. Right, so as we said, you know, were there warning signs? And in our video last week, um, Neil actually asked us a nice question and he said, you know, how many of these countries, um, you know, have been added to NATO? So I found a pretty cool video that we're ah, going to show people. Yeah. I think it's it's not a very long video. I think it's like just mm -hmm. about a minute and a half. But this pr is a pretty good illustration of what's happened since 1951. So when you watch this animation in the beginning, you'll see it's that Russia is actually labeled Russia, but it should be the USSR. And around 1990, 1991, mm -hmm. something kind of changes and you'll see Russia gets smaller and that's when the USSR fell. Mm -hmm. But yeah, well, let's have a look at it, right? So you ready? Okay. All right, let's check. That's pretty crazy, this right? Uh, this video is pretty cool because in the short time, you just like explain the... You can why, see why the movement, yeah. Yeah, you see the movement. You can see that Russia's gonna feel something very different from sure. this. <laughs> well, I mean, as we showed in that video last week, right? So in 91, they were promised that they wouldn't move one inch to the east. Mm -hmm. But it looks like they've moved a hell of a lot more than one inch to the east, right? Mm -hmm. And if you were, if you're trying to put yourself in the shoes of how the Russian people must feel, when they look at that, they must feel, wow, like we're under threat, right? Yeah. I mean, not being biased at all, but just looking at that, that does definitely look like a threat when you see what's happening, mm -hmm. right? So, so yeah, what did you think when you watched that? I think that all of a sudden, like uh, the Europe, West Europe, mm -hmm. is try to be close to nato yeah they want to be part of uh, part I of mean, nato right yeah, yeah yeah because they i think they need some support but for russia he may they may not feel good because nato is 
build up to like a right onto the border, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, okay. ground and border, and the attitude is not friendly to Russia. Sure. So, do you think that Russia probably had some kind of a line in the sand, a red line that shouldn't be crossed? Mm-hmm. Probably, right? I mean, you can only accept so much when someone's pushing, pushing, pushing. Eventually, you do react, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. And now I, I think it, the the most uh, countries are uh, that just next to Russia is like a uh, Ukraine, Belarus, and Finland, mm. right? Sure. And now, like a uh, Finland and Belarus is like uh, in the middle, but Ukraine is the the attitude is the lean to the NATO and the America, so no wonder Russia want to. I think they want a flag. Mm. Maybe they want to say, "Hey, stop, stop here." Sure. Well, I think that's kind of the red line. It was like once it's on our border, mm-hmm. that's going to be when you cross our red line. Yeah. Great. So, like, what I wanted to show you is, I did a whole lot of research this week and found some stuff. And the question that I'm asking really is, were there warning signs? Like, did anybody try and give a warning about this? Was the U.S. aware? Was NATO aware of that red line mm-hmm. and what it would mean? And maybe that can help us to see if people weren't paying attention to those warning signs. Mm -hmm. All right, so let's have a look. So first uh, website we're going to look at, uh, we're also going to look at some videos, but this is from the Washington Post. And you can see here, this is from March 5th, 2014. And it says, Henry Kissinger, to settle the Ukraine crisis, start at the end. So this guy, Henry Henry Kissinger, was Secretary of State of America from 1973 to 1977. Mm -hmm. And he says it here, he's like, public discussions on Ukraine is all about confrontation. But do we know where we're going? In my life, I've seen four wars begun with great enthusiasm and public support, all of which we did not know how to end, and from three of which we withdrew unilaterally. Mm -hmm. The test of policy is how it ends, not how it begins. I can kind of agree with that. Then he says here as well, far too often the Ukrainian issue is posed as a showdown, whether Ukraine joins the East or the West. But if Ukraine is to survive and thrive, it must not be either side's outpost against the other. It should function as a bridge between them. Mm -hmm. That makes sense to me as well, right? If you think about it, a bridge Mm -hmm. in the middle so that there's nothing on Russia's border seems to make sense. I think they'd probably agree with that. Mm -hmm. Then he talks about both sides. He says Russia must must accept that to try to force Ukraine into a satellite status and thereby move Russia's borders again, would doom Moscow to repeat its history of self-fulfilling cycles of reciprocal pressures with Europe and the United States. Self-fulfilling mm. cycles. Mm-hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think he's saying there that Russia mustn't try to expand, mustn't try to mm-hmm. you know, change Re- its borders. You mean like a rebuild there? The USSR, possibly, the, yeah. Mm-hmm. Then here he says, the West must understand that to Russia, Ukraine can never be just a foreign country. Russian history began in what was called Kievan Rus. Mm. The Russian religion spread from there. Ukraine has been part of Russia for centuries, and their histories were intertwined before then. Some of the most important battles for Russian freedom, starting with the Battle of Poltava in 1709, were fought on Ukrainian soil. The Black Sea Fleet, Russia's means of projecting power in the Mediterranean, that's from where they're based in Crimea, is based by long-term lease in Sevastopol in Crimea. Okay, so he's talking about all of this here and just saying that, you know, Mm. this is very important to them. This is very, very very important important to Russia, Russia, Mm -hmm. like the the Ukraine issue, right? Mm -hmm. Then let's have a look at another one. And you'll see this website here. U.S. government knew NATO expansion to Ukraine would force Russia to intervene. When is that? This is a new article, Mm -hmm. but you can see what it says here. Former U.S. ambassador to Russia... So someone who should know what he's talking about, William J. Burns, Mm -hmm. who is now the CIA director, Mm -hmm. admitted in a classified 2008 embassy cable that NATO expansion to Ukraine crosses Moscow's security red lines Mm -hmm. and could potentially split the country in two, leading to violence or even some claim civil war, which would force Russia to decide whether to intervene. Okay. Right. Mm -hmm. So we now have seen that, yes, they did intervene. Mm -hmm. And this is the guy who is who was the ambassador to Russia, who's now the CIA director. And he was talking about this and he was Mm -hmm. talking about it from 2008. 
So I don't know what other people think, but that sounds almost like a warning, saying, yeah. listen, we know if we do this, there's going to be a problem. They right? already know that Ukraine's uh, location is very important. Mm. So I, I don't know, that's the Ukraine's destiny, because they couldn't change it. Eh? Mm. They're just, just next to Russia. Sure. So, so we're going to see in one of the videos I'm going to show you that um, there's, a, there's a guy who was actually talking about this in a video mm -hmm. and talking about, like, I think the way he describes it is making some of these countries feel that it's okay mm -hmm. to push Russia and that they'll be accepted into NATO. Right. So, and you can see here, it also talks about it and says, at the annual NATO summit back in 2008, the George W. Bush administration publicly called for adding Russia's neighbors, Ukraine and Georgia, to the military alliance. NATO Secretary General declared that the two countries would eventually become members. And from what I understand, it was after that that Russia went into Georgia. Oh. So it's not even just that there was a red line. They talked about adding Georgia and Ukraine, and then Russia went into Georgia. And Georgia is on the border of Russia. Okay. So they've already got an example of a time when this already happened, when Russia already reacted and went into Georgia. So it's like a history. They yeah. already have the same reaction. And that's 2008. That's not that long ago. So they already saw how they would react once. Surely that shows how they would possibly react this time. Mm -hmm. Right. Then there's a guy, Noam Chomsky, okay, who's like a, quite a famous guy, like a famous scholar and thinker in America. I mean, some people like him, some people don't. And he had a warning from 2015 on Ukraine joining NATO. So in a 2015 interview with Amy Goodman of Democracy Now!, Chomsky issued a clear warning about Ukraine. Speaking shortly after the murder of Putin critic and opposition politician Boris Nemtsov, Chomsky said that the Obama administration at the time was not considering the background of the Ukraine conflict and was behaving myopically and imperialistically. Okay, So according to Chomsky, the Western push to get Ukraine to join the North Atlantic Treaty was a big mistake that mm. could lead to war with Russia. Why they want to the Western try to get Ukraine to join NATO, right? I s it's a very good question, right? I Is mean, I know that, that they have to buy weapons from the U.S., right, if they're part of NATO. Mm -hmm. They're going to buy weapons yeah. from... Oh, so you mean, like, they can't... They're going to have a kind of client, a new client. I mean, possibly, right? But them. there's also that very old kind of... Um, I think it's like a hundred-year-old idea that the, the country that controls the Eurasian landmass... So, Eurasian. Yeah, so Europe and Asia runs the world. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I mean, maybe some people don't want Russia to be friendly with Europe because that would unite Europe. But again, that's speculation. I, I'm saying that because I've seen other people talk about that, mm -hmm. but not 100% sure that that's true. I don't think anybody, you know, we can mm -hmm. say we exactly know, right? Right, so let's have a look at some videos. Those are some websites. I first want to show you there is a guy called Stephen Cohen. Mm -hmm. Okay, he was an American scholar of Russian studies. Okay, his academic work concentrated on modern Russian history. So he knows a lot about this type of thing. And I think he's quite recognized as being, you know, quite a mm -hmm. knowledgeable person on this. Okay. So let's have a look at this video of his, right? Okay. Uh, if we move the forces, NATO forces, including American troops, uh, to toward Russia's borders. Uh, where will we be then? I mean, it's obviously going to militarize the situation and therefore raise the danger of war. And I think it's important to emphasize, though I regret saying this, Russia will not back off. This is existential. Too much has happened. Putin, and it's not just Putin. We seem to think Putin runs the whole of the universe. He has a political class. That political class has opinions. Public support is running overwhelmingly in favor of Russian policy. Putin will compromise at these negotiations, but he will not back off if confronted militarily. He will All right. So you can hear another guy talking about that, saying, listen, Putin will act. He's not going to back down. Mm -hmm. Right, so that's another guy who is a scholar who who talks about the stuff, who knows about it, saying exactly the same thing. Right, mm -hmm. then we saw that Noam Chomsky guy. Let's watch what he said. The idea that Ukraine might join a Western military alliance would be quite unacceptable to any Russian leader. This goes back to 1990. 
when the Soviet Union collapsed. Uh, there was a question as to what would happen with NATO. Uh, Gorbachev agreed to allow Germany to be unified and to join NATO. It's a pretty remarkable concession with a quid pro quo that NATO would not expand one inch to the east. That was the phrase that was used. So Russia has been provoked? Well, what happened? NATO instantly moved to East Germany. Then Clinton came along, uh, expanded NATO right to the borders of Russia. Now there are uh, the, Russian, the new Ukrainian government, the government after the overthrow of the preceding one, uh, the parliament voted, uh, I think, 300 to 8 or something like that to move to join NATO. This Which is, you can understand why they would want to join NATO. You can see why Petro Poroshenko's government would probably see that it's protecting his country. No, no, it's not protect. Crimea was taken away after the overthrow of the government, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, he's not protecting Ukraine. Is uh, threatening Ukraine with major war. Well, that's not protection. Uh, the point is, this is a serious a strategic threat to Russia which any Russian leader would have to react to. That's well understood. All right, so mm. any Russian leader would mm. react. Yeah. And you yeah. see there, I mean, one of the things that keeps kind of coming out here is that these actions are putting Ukraine mm -hmm. in a bad situation. Because he was talking about Poroshenko, who was the guy who I think became the president after Yanukovych got kicked out and fled the country. Mm. So, you know, then he's basically then putting Ukraine under pressure and there's a guy who kind of under who explains this i suppose a little bit better um and you can see it here i've got two videos let's see which one it is but i actually think that what's going on here is that the west is leading ukraine down the primrose path and the end result is that ukraine is going to get wrecked mm. and i believe that the policy that i'm advocating which is neutralizing Ukraine and then building it up economically and getting it out of the competition between Russia on one side and NATO on the other side is the best thing that could happen to the Ukrainians. What we're doing is encouraging the Ukrainians to play tough with the Russians. We we're encouraging the Ukrainians to think that they will ultimately become part of the West because we will ultimately defeat Putin and we will ultimately get our way. Time is on our side. And, of course, the Ukrainians are playing along with this. And the Ukrainians are almost completely unwilling to compromise with the Russians and instead want to pursue a hardline policy. Well, as I said to you before, if they do that, the end result is that their country is going to be wrecked. And what we're doing is, in effect, encouraging that outcome. I think it would make much more sense for us to, neutral, to, to work to create a neutral Ukraine. It would be in our interest to bury this crisis as quickly as possible. It certainly would be in Russia's interest to do so. And most importantly, it would be in Ukraine's interest to put an end to the crisis. Thank you. Right. So do you see what he's saying there, right? He's saying that <clears throat> the way that NATO has been acting mm. is giving confidence to the Ukraine people and the Ukraine government mm -hmm. and giving them confidence to then push Join with them. Russia and mm. not compromise. Mm. But he said there that and this was in 2015, right? Mm -hmm. That that's going to wreck Ukraine. What's happening right now? Ukraine is being wrecked. Mm -hmm. Right? And they're not willing to compromise that much. So, you know, who's, who's losing it? I mean, is America really losing? No. The people who have been pushing some of this stuff, they're not losing. But Ukraine is losing. All these people are dying. Yeah, people are dying. And they're, they have to run away Um all of the country's land in infrastructure is all down. Sure, the infrastructure, infrastructure everything, infrastructure, yeah. everything. So even even the war stop, how can they come back and rebuild all the family land? Sure, it's, it's not easy. So you think like uh, the NATO and United States they try to think about? I, I don't know what I think about. They try to, uh, try to persuade Ukraine. But at the end, they don't really suffer. What is who suffer is in Ukraine? Sure, right. But I mean, they keep pushing and saying, right, we're going to admit you to NATO. So then Ukraine thinks, right, we we can trust protected. these guys. We're mm -hmm. going to get protected. But then look what happened in Georgia. They said that Georgia was going to be able to join, and Russia went in there 
mm-hmm. and now they're doing it with Ukraine, but they give them this false sense of security that mm. they'll be protected. You tell me, are Ukraine being, is Ukraine being protected now? I mean, they're, they're giving them weapons, but they're not protecting them. I mean, they don't have the obligation to protect them. Yeah, you, you give them, I don't know, you give them weapon means more people die. And they are maybe more citizen, no more people die. So yeah. I, don't, I don't think it's really help, help the Ukraine. It, exactly right. So that, that's the point I think is being made, right? Mm. Is that the Ukrainian people are going to suffer from this. Mm. But as you saw from all these things, were there people, and not just people, famous people warning that this would happen? Yes, there uh, were. They, they are family with uh, Russia. Sure. I think they do some research about Or there were people who worked in the U.S. government. And there are way more. I mean, I could show you. I mean, Jeffrey Sachs, uh, Jack Matlock Jr., George Kennan, a whole lot of famous people who all like either worked in the government or are very famous for knowing about this issue were all warning about the same thing, saying this is Putin's red line. Mm-hmm. So if you know that that's his red line, why would you be pushing it? Mm-hmm. And then we, I suppose, what we can look at is and say, is it reasonable? We go right back to that video at the beginning with the NATO expansion, and you could see there that if I mean, if you were Russian and you saw all these countries joining in this military alliance because NATO is a military alliance, mm-hmm. then so you're gonna be worried, right? You're gonna, yeah, you're gonna prepare for that. You could have just see sitting there and do nothing yeah. and watch the all the military allies close to you. Sure, you must do something like. Stop it. So if you know what will happen and then you still push it to happen, how much responsibility is on you for pushing that thing to happen when you knew what would happen before? Mm. Must be some, right? I mean, I'm not trying to say who's right and who's wrong here. Like war, as we said in the beginning, is terrible, right? Because Mm. it's not the right way when people, the ordinary people suffer and die for this thing. But... What caused this? Could it have been avoided was the question right at the beginning. Didn't they learn any lessons? Mm -hmm. Because if that's the red line, like we don't want NATO, if you're Russia at least, we don't want NATO right on our borders. We don't want weapons on our borders. Mm -hmm. That's our red line. And then you cross it. How much responsibility is yours? Mm. To me, quite a bit. Yeah. So yeah, I don't know what people think about this. I'd love to hear if people think that what we're saying is wrong. But I see a lot of smart, apparently smart, famous people all warning about the same thing. Uh-huh. Why weren't you listening? Yeah, uh, I still wonder. I think they they try to take benefits from Ukraine. I think Ukraine have something they want, so they very uh, aggressive to ask jo- Ukraine to join them. Mm. So, and and they, they they probably know they were gonna be a war, so they told Ukraine, "Oh, don't worry, we're gonna protect you." Possibly, right? Giving them false hope. May I yeah. know, maybe I I just, I don't know. I think it looks like they already know they're gonna have a war, and but they really want Ukraine's maybe some I don't know natural gas or something else. Well, there's definitely uh, a lot of energy stuff. Energy yeah, stuff or something. That, right. I don't know. They really want Ukraine. Mm. But so as you okay. saw there, they were talking about making these people, making the Ukrainians feel overconfident. Mm. And I mean, they definitely are because, I mean, what has Ukraine been calling for? A no-fly zone? That's basically like World War Three. So, what I mean, what is their thinking, right? Like, we were, we're asking them to make... Uh, we're asking NATO and the US to make a no-fly zone, which yeah. will, like, basically co- cause World oh. War Three. Yeah. Like, why would you even be pushing for that? That makes absolutely no sense. You mean Ukraine? Yeah. Maybe you're going to promise he is... The Zelensky is promised before. I don't know. Maybe, right? I don't know. I just guess. But maybe they have f- a false sense of confidence because of the behavior of NATO in the US. And that's why they feel that it's okay for them to push like this. Oh. Instead of compromising, right? And, and uh, we saw it last week, right? I mean, the West and the East have been fighting for, like, what, seven, eight years? Mm-hmm. 14,000 people dead. Mm-hmm. So if, what were Russia's demands this week? I mean, there were three, right? They said one... Um, you, you'll never be able to join NATO. You need to change like some kind of constitutions that you can't join NATO. To make that Donbass area on the east, make that um, yeah. uh, autonomous, yeah. and then also say Crimea, Crimea is belongs, belongs to, to Russia. Russia. 
But why I don't, Ukraine reject? Yeah, I mean yeah. those three things don't sound that bad to me. I mean personally, right? Because the Crimea, though those people apparently voted to join Russia, and also Russia had always had Crimea, that port where mm -hmm. they can their their warm water port for their navy has yeah. always been there. Yeah. I don't think they were going to give that up. So mm -hmm. Crimea, I understand the the area in the east. You can make, make it into a bit of a buffer between mm -hmm. the two. So somewhere that's autonomous, it doesn't belong to Russia or Ukraine. Mm -hmm. I don't see the issue with that one. And they're not joining NATO. I also have, don't see the problem with just, that, right? That's what mm -hmm. they were promised for so long. They're just a stay, status quo. Like it's just not, I mean, just a stay in the same position. It does, I mean, like uh, Russia's requirement means they could go back to the past maybe kind one of, years yeah. ago kind of like mm. that right because you, you just ask ukraine not to join nato yeah they are not member yeah and donbass area i think uh, the citizens there already want to be part of russia be part of russia and they have lots of fights with, uh, with ukraine the ukraine government yeah. for a long time sure and so Korea. this wouldn't make them part of russia or part of ukraine they'd be autonomous they'd, they'd run themselves right lead themselves yeah so i so I don't really see why that's a huge issue. Mm, I think it's not a bad uh, agreement. Sure. I think it's a more like a in the middle yeah. or nature. And know. people would stop dying if you're willing to compromise. Yeah. But instead you're calling for no fly zones, which would make the thing way bigger for everybody. Yeah, that's a question, right? Right? Yeah. Why? Why, why they want to? Yeah. Why, why call for a war? Sure, because that's what it would be, right? You make a no fly zone. Somebody's airplane gets shot down, and now it's been shot down directly by that person there's no mm -hmm. more proxy war and then with the conflict just keeps getting bigger and bigger and six months later we're in a world war mm. and when you could have again stopped it earlier just compromise a little bit mm. so yeah both sides need to compromise right yeah mm. but again if you look at that nato expansion thing how long has russia really not mm -hmm. like responded Yes, they did with Georgia, mm -hmm. but that was because they were again it was someone on their border, tr and they were saying we're going to admit you to NATO. And actually, let me show you that guy John Mearsheimer. So I, the, I can show you a little bit of this other video. It's a bit longer, mm -hmm. but he talks a little bit about this. So let's watch quickly. Because he's making it clear that you're fooling around with his core strategic interests, and again, he's got thousands of nuclear weapons. So you're putting yourself in a position. Right? You're putting yourself in a position where you're willing to risk a possible nuclear war over a piece of real estate, Ukraine, that is, a, that is not of vital strategic interest to the United States. Yeah, it's a good question, right? Why is Ukraine vital to the interests of the U.S.? It's not. But you're willing to risk a, risk a world war, a nuclear war for that? Vital. Doesn't make vital. sense, right? Okay, and then... My argument is that the West is principally responsible for this mess, not the Russians. Uh, this, of course, is not the conventional wisdom in the United States. Uh, there are not many people who agree with me. But uh, I, I think the facts are quite clear on this, that the West is responsible. Our basic goal has been to make Ukraine a Western bulwark on Russia's border. And Russia says, this ain't happening. Period. End of story. And we will do everything we can to make sure it does not happen. Right. So, I mean, you see there, he was talking about it, right? Mm -hmm. He was warning about that. Then you can see if go further. Mm -hmm. But as you all know, since the Cold War ended, starting with the Clinton administration, we have been moving NATO eastward toward Russia's border. Which we and the Russians have said, this is an absolute no-no. Second is EU expansion. EU expansion is all about integrating Ukraine economically into the West. The way we are in the process of integrating Poland, the Czech Republic, Slovakia, the Baltic states into the West. And of course, we're doing that with NATO as well. These are two sets of institutions, NATO, military institution, the EU, an economic institution. 
And the idea, again, is to take Ukraine, peel it away from Russia, and make it part of the West. As you all know, the United States runs around the world trying to topple regimes and put in their place democratically elected regimes. And for almost all of you, because our basic strategy is to topple regimes all over the world, not simply because we like democracy, but because we believe that whoever gets elected will be pro-Western. So we're killing two birds with one stone. We're promoting democracy and getting leaders who are pro-American. But again, you can see the strategy here, NATO expansion, EU expansion, and promoting democracy. Okay, and then we'll watch one, one quick one. This is this one as well, you'll see. But then the big trouble starts. And it comes in the famous Bucharest summit in April 2008, where at the end of the summit, uh, a declaration is issued which says, NATO welcomes Ukraine's and Georgia's Euro-Atlantic aspirations for membership in NATO. We agreed today that these countries will become members of NATO. Putin himself said, Georgia and Ukraine becoming part of NATO is a direct threat to Russia. You all remember that there was a war between Russia and Georgia in August 2008. That war was a consequence of this because the Georgians thought we were sending them a signal that they could get uppity with the Russians and we would back them because they were going to become part of NATO. That's not what happened. And you know what happened. The Russians clobbered the Georgians and Georgia is in deep trouble today because it thought it, be it could become part of NATO. So do you see what he's talking about there, right? Yeah. This already happened. It sounds like a repeat, right? They gave the people of Georgia mm. a strange message, which mm. made them think that NATO would help them. Yeah. But then NATO didn't help them, and Russia went in and flattened their country, yeah. right? Yeah. And Putin at the time, because they included Ukraine in there in 2008, yeah. and Putin said, no, these are red lines. Mm -hmm. So now that they pushed it this year, mm -hmm. Putin did exactly the same thing. So... Obviously, war is terrible, right? But let's go back to the question at the beginning. And we're asking, could this have been avoided? Were there warning signs? Mm. How can you look at it and say no? It's impossible, right? Because it's... Yeah, for going. me, I think it's like a, they already know they uh, try to poke it. Mm. It's a weird feeling. Like I, I think they won the war. Sure. And then how about this for a fact? So Nord Stream 2, right? The new pipeline yeah. from Germany to Russia. Mm -hmm. What was the deal with that? Where America said to Germany, okay, you can have your pipeline, mm. but if Russia ever attacks Ukraine, then you have to cancel the pipeline. Oh, they said it. Yeah. So now that Russia has attacked Ukraine, mm -hmm. now they can't have the pipeline. Now you see Germany completely changing its whole energy policy. Mm-hmm. So how much of this is really about oil and resources or possibly stopping Germany and the European countries from getting closer to Russia? Possibly, right? We, we, we don't know for sure, but it does seem to be like that, right? Uh-huh. You mean like I try to uh, let European and Russia... Sure. Separate. Because as I said to you in the beginning, right, there's that famous belief the mm. old for like a hundred years whoever controls the eurasian continent controls the world so oh. if you let the western european countries get closer to russia mm -hmm. and then they kind of not join and become the same country but make an alliance and become more mm -hmm. cl closer together mm -hmm. who does that threaten oh no. through the people running the world apparently right the mm -hmm. u.s they feel like oh i i got another competitor mm. So you got to do everything you can to keep that from happening. Oh, but why was it. Germany making Nord Stream too? I mean, wouldn't it make sense for them to kind of be friendlier with Russia, mm -hmm. get their energy from Russia, have a better relationship, a good relationship? And throughout this, you've seen Germany trying to calm it down, calm it down the mm -hmm. whole time. Yeah. But someone doesn't seem to want that to happen, right? I think uh, jo uh, Germany needs the energy, right? So yeah. they have to make a good relationship r with Russia. Yeah. But uh, some maybe some people don't 
don't want that to happen. Yeah, they don't want it to happen. They would they don't want the Europe country and Russia being so close. Sure. Makes a lot of sense, right? So they try to start then. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then you wonder why it seemed like certain countries were pushing this conflict to happen. Mm. Kind of explains why, right? But anyway, that's just what we think, right? So we'd love to hear what you think. Um, you know, again, YouTube, we're not saying we know what's happening. We're just trying to talk about warning signs and is there a way we could have avoided this? Because I think everybody agrees mm-hmm. that if this could have been avoided, it would have been the best solution. We don't want violence. We don't want war. We like mm-hmm. to believe we're civilized. What does it mean, right? It means that we solve things by discussion and, and making agreements and compromising. Mm-hmm. Not pushing the way that this thing has been pushed. Yeah. So we want to stop the war. We don't want to like see people die. Sure, it's, it's horrific. Better, yeah. I think it's better like they, they sit down and make some new negotiation. Mm. Make some compromise. Exactly, right? Exactly what you want to see on a smaller scale mm. when it comes to fights between people, right? Mm-hmm. Sit down, hear both sides, make compromise, find a win-win situation for everybody. Yeah. Right, so okay. if you haven't watched our video from last week, uh, I would definitely recommend it. And it was in the video somewhere. You'll see the link to it. Okay, but yeah, let us know what you think. And if you haven't subscribed, please subscribe, give us a share, or yeah, just click that like button. Yeah. All right, move to the next topic. Yeah, cool. Okay, good. Okay.